Hello, everybody. This is Ann Jekyll from New Mexico EPSCoR. It's just noon on the dot, so I'm going to give folks a minute to join as our attendee count is going up. So stay tuned for about 30 seconds and we will start our webinar. You shouldn't be clacking. No, you don't. Have to. Okay. Well, we're one minute past the hour, so I'll go ahead and get started, and others can join us as we go along. Uh, again, my name is Ann Jekyll. I'm the Associate Director of New Mexico EPSCoR, and I'd like to welcome you to our second New Mexico Smart Grid Center webinar. Today we'll be talking about Network DC Microgrids with Gary Opedal from Ameritechnologies, and I will introduce him in a second, but I wanted to remind you the purpose of these webinars, which is to present research and promote collaboration across our project. And in addition, we'll provide a venue for outside presenters working on subjects related to microgrids and other topics of interest to Mexico Smart Grid Center team members to present. So that's what we'll hear about today. Uh, we will host these webinars the fourth Friday of every month at noon, uh, so please mark your calendars. And if you have ideas of presenters you would like to hear from or would like to present yourself, please contact me. You can find uh, my information on our website, nmfscore.org, pretty readily. I've deployed a poll here that is asking how you would like to hear about these webinars. We're fine-tuning our process to um, get the word out to you all and to get you to join. So please take a minute to fill out this poll. You look somewhere on your screen, Zoom pops it up and I'll end it in a second. And one item of webinar housekeeping, we have a question and answer box. And this is where you can communicate with us and ask questions of Gary as he's presenting and we will moderate a Q&A. So um, please uh, contact us that way. One reminder is the our next webinar, which will be on November 22nd at noon, and we will have the New Mexico National Laboratories presenting. So Arthur Byrnes from Los Alamos National Laboratory will be presenting on protection of inverter interface microgrids, and Jay Johnson from Sandia National Laboratories will be presenting on a recently completed project on distribution voltage regulation provided by multiple distributed energy resource control strategies, both topics that are very relevant to our project research areas. So please join us and uh, mark your calendar now for that. So with that, I would like to introduce Gary Opadal from Ameritechnologies. Gary has 30 years of entrepreneurial leadership and technical management experience and has started many successful companies, also serving as the Director of Economic Development at the City of Albuquerque. He speaks the language of many in our project as he's an electrical engineer by degree, and he currently holds the position of Vice President of Emerging Technologies at Amera, or a subsidiary called Amera Technologies. Amera, for those of you that don't know, is the company that owns New Mexico Gas Company, but it is primarily primarily an electric utility. And Amer Technologies is pursuing multiple demonstrations of networked DC microgrids. The first project is at Kirtland Air Force Base, and it's connected to all of the testing infrastructure at Sandia National Laboratories. And it is absolutely tremendous what he and Amer Technologies have been able to do in a very short period of time. And Gary and I have had some conversations about ways that our researchers can collaborate with him to promote New Mexico as the place to pursue microgrid research. So with that, I will cede control of the, um, the interface to Gary and uh, turn it over to him and his presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that you can, uh, that you can hear me and uh, welcome. Uh, and as Ann said, it is uh, my desire that uh, that New Mexico become the, the center of the universe with respect to uh, uh, advanced microgrids uh, or distributed energy systems, um, which uh, we would prefer, but most people understand uh, what microgrids are. 
Um, I am uh, now employed by a utility, and so uh, I will make sure that we do our safety briefing first. Usually, if you are out at the site, and I do encourage everyone to come out and see what we've done there, there's nothing like a tour. I'm going to try to describe something that is very difficult to understand unless you're actually sitting in it and you can watch uh, energy being moved around um, uh, from place to place. Uh, but uh, in this, in that safety briefing, I would tell you, uh, as we pull panels and look in things, don't uh, point at things with your fingers and and uh, and and follow the instructions of uh, of your of your tour guide, and uh, and to be safe uh, around uh, 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 electricity and energy. Uh, for this purpose, I'll just say uh, I hope that no one is uh, driving and will be distracted. Uh, or operating any uh, heavy equipment. And uh, if I put you to sleep, hopefully there's nothing in front of you when your head hits, hits, hits the desk. Uh, so uh, I show, this is my kind of my street cred slide, but I show it only uh, because uh, I want to tell you that my dad brought me here to Albuquerque when he was the head of the Defense Nuclear Agency. He ran the last two underground nuclear shots for the United States up at the up at Mercury test site. And uh, I really believed that we would all be doing the George Jetson thing, flying around in our uh, flying cars and uh, having uh, robots, 20 hour week, uh, work weeks, and that we would have uh, abundant nuclear power. That's what I grew up in, that was the paradigm. Um, and, uh, but he would say that the reason why that didn't happen was because well, we did not standardize uh, properly. And so you'll, you'll see standardization and getting a building block approach and then fractalizing uh, is a huge part of, uh, of what we do. But the other things uh, to note on here is, other than I'm genetically unemployable with this large list, is, is that I grew up at Intel um, uh, after Air Force and, and electrical engineering degree. And so that forms my model toward uh, a meshed network and a, and a network of network and nodes uh, type of approach. Uh, so, and uh, I've had some other experiences. I did start up a, a medical company just because my, uh, of an incident that happened with my mother that is thriving here in New Mexico. And then the city of Albuquerque is interesting in that that's how I actually met the folks uh, from Amira as they were buying the New Mexico gas company. And uh, it taught me a lot about how to get things done in, in large bureaucracies. And of course, the regulatory risks are the largest risks we have in trying to implement uh, microgrids. Um, I'll move forward just to let you know that Amira, uh, just a, a little bit of a background. Uh, they're a $30 billion in asset company, uh, utility hold co in six countries. So uh, Canada, the United States and four Caribbean countries. Um, and this is, when you get to the why of why we were formed uh, to start this business, um, uh, you can see that on the East Coast here. So Amera is a, like I said, a $30 billion utility hold co. Amera Technologies is a, an LLC with one member, Amera, but it is a skunk works. It is meant to be separate from Amera so that we can uh, move quickly and, uh, and really look at disruptions uh, in the utility space. But you can see that along the East Coast is most of their holdings and in the Caribbean islands. So they're very interested in things that weren't going to blow down. They're also very interested in safety and, uh, and, and trying to rebuild things easily uh, and safely. And so that's a large part of the impetus of forming uh, Mara Technologies was to think about how could we uh, build things that would be safe to either direct bury or to even lay on the ground. And, uh, and, and how could we move things forward given the trends in the utility world? And that was our three-year charter uh, when we were formed a year and a half ago. Um, they did not expect the amount of progress we've made. And they, they, since they, we had an initial tranche of money uh, a couple of weeks ago, they've since uh, put in more money uh, because of our success. But let's get to the problem. Renewable penetration is not progressing at the scale or pace necessary uh, even for our renewable portfolio standards that, that uh, we in New Mexico witnessed our governor sign earlier this year. In uh, addition to that, uh, we have a paradigm where uh, resilience and readiness for our military uh, and any critical site is really uh, the, the current strategy is diesel generators. And, 
uh, we know that that's not going to be the right approach long term. And if we could figure out how to how to come to a point where you're not making a choice between resilience and renewables, but actually you see them as the same thing, that would be the goal. Additionally, the technology is piecemeal. We, uh, we just came back from Solar Power International a couple of weeks ago, uh, you know, 19,000 people uh, uh, talking about renewables and microgrids and all kinds of different things. But you have the 5,000 aisle, which is solar, and the 4,000, which is wind, and the 3,000, which is controls. There's no systems approach. So we saw that. And then the business model is, is fragmented. So that's what we decided to address. And our approach was to take a blank sheet of paper and some folks who had energy expertise, some folks who had utility experience, uh, partner with our good buddies at the Sandia National Labs. This is probably my seventh uh, CRADA, Collaborative Research and Development Agreement. Uh, our friends at UNM uh, and even uh, NMSU, uh, now that Olga is there and, and Dr. Dan Arbuso, who I've known for years. And, uh, and then how do we get some motivated resources uh, to take advantage of the trends in cost and approach, right? And that was our approach. Um, when you start with a key, with a blank sheet of paper, you come up with uh, a lot of good key attributes. Um, uh, and uh, um, I'm not gonna go through all of these today. Uh, I'll just stress a few, but you know, uh, if you've got a super safe system, just for instance, just to pick one out, workforce development, um, you can, uh, it is our intent that you do a six week uh, training course at a, at a local community college, at Santa Fe Community College or, or a CNM, um, and you would be an energy tech. Uh, that's a lot different than sending uh, two, uh, you know, two year plus experienced folks in a quarter million dollar truck to the top of a, of a power pole. And so we think that that will help in, especially in rural areas in New Mexico and provide on ramps to low and no skilled folks who can uh, to learn how to maintain uh, these kinds of systems. But again, I, I'll just I'll just hit on a few of these. Just to, the point is with a blank sheet of paper, you can you can really get through uh, and create something from scratch, which which bends a lot of minds. And uh, and so mindset is whenever you're talking about something really, truly new and disruptive, it's really about the psychology and less about the technology. The technology is absolutely important and it's an ante to get into the game, but the psychology is more important. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as we go through forward. What we call a microgrid, uh, a distributed energy system, um, is different than many microgrids you've seen. Uh, not to say that those microgrids aren't important, they very much are. And we are standing on the shoulders of a lot of microgrid uh, uh, expertise and progress that has been made. However, ours is a bit different. And I just wanna start out by emphasizing that, that this is DC versus AC for its distribution. It's AC at both ends, both the, at the home or building level and at the bulk power grid level. But the distribution within the microgrid is DC. It's decentralized control versus centralized control. Uh, and, and as a matter of fact, it's, it's, it's actually distributed control um, not all, it has the capability of being totally decentralized, but it's distributed. It's modular and standardized versus custom. Uh, the old joke of you've seen one microgrid, you've seen one microgrid. Um, we want to have uh, standards, uh, standard pieces of equipment that you just order. This is how many buildings, you, this is how many nanogrid boxes you get. It's front of the meter versus behind the meter, which allows the utilities to play. Um, that's a big part of what we do is we were looking at uh, current infrastructure and the problem with behind the meter resources is that there's no control of those resources and you get problems that are seen in Hawaii and California with duck curve and uh, net metering issues which will eventually go away it's not sustainable and how do we then control those things uh, at each building and uh, and you'll see from our schematics that this is front of the meter versus behind the meter it's network versus non-networked uh, you know in a in a tabletop exercise uh, in a community or a base before an event, uh, if you uh, pick the wrong building and put a diesel generator next to it, well, then all the other buildings are, are out of luck. And um, we believe that network to node, a, a node, mesh network of nodes is the best way to go. New uh, distributed energy resources are easy to apply versus hard, and we utilize the in existing infrastructure. 
So we all know that the disruption is coming of decarbonization, digitalization, and decentralization. And <clears throat> one of the things I've learned over my career is uh, to look out over the horizon and find the thermals and ride the thermals versus flapping so hard. These things are going to happen. It's like, uh, you know, the, the digital camera was invented at, at, in Kodak. Uh, and uh, they came to management and, and management said it, but it doesn't have film. Well, you, you, can, you can fight trends that are happening or you can join in. And as a matter of fact, look ahead 20 years and then work backwards. That's what we're choosing to do here. We want to create a platform. This will be uh, something that uh, many, many will spawn many, many more businesses. We are trying to be like the, like the Cisco of the internet. We're going to be the, the basic platform, the basic building block. As a matter of fact, that's what we call it, block, block energy, um, of a, the new bi-directional energy network. And, uh, and so we, we want, we, that's what we expect to be as a, as a platform. This is a line diagram. The line diagram is um, just meant to be instructional of our clean, affordable, safe, and always on uh, 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 product here. But if you look at each house take, or, or, or building, take uh, number one there, um, what we do is we put, we make it just like your cell phone. It, it has its own generation, it has its own storage, uh, and it has its own power electronics, each one. And if you have that, and if you have the building running off of the battery through an inverter, split phase AC, they, they get exactly what they get out of their meter now, um, then uh, that says a lot of things about how you can design the loop, or if you think of it like the bus here, uh, that delivers energy to it. It, it doesn't have to be on all the time. Uh, it can, you can design us uh, really good safety factors, and we've got intellectual property around our safety. This is a relatively slow uh, system uh, in that it, a battery asks to be first to be charged, and you have a nice slow ramp up. You charge the battery, nice slow ramp down. And our uh, intellectual property around our uh, fault detection and protection does not involve overcurrent. Uh, it, it, it says that anytime you've got any kind of ramp that is outside of what's expected, you turn the whole system off. And from an engineering standpoint, you can think of this system as normally off versus normally on, which means that uh, you can really uh, hit the safety part uh, really well. Additionally, this is, a, this is an energy system, not a power system. Now we deal with energy and power at the storage and at each nanogrid box at each home. However, the distribution system is an energy system. Uh, it's an average, so you can design for the average. So your local utility is somewhere between 15 and 20% of the capacity is only used uh, a, couple, a couple days per year. Uh, our fellow member of EPSCOR, John Hawkins, likes to say we design for Christmas and Easter but we run the church um, on a normal Sunday. And uh, in, a, in this situation, you don't have to. Uh, you're designing for the average and not uh, the peak. Additionally, uh, what you see down there to the lower left is each microgrid has its own additional energy park, we call it, block energy park, which has additional storage, additional ground-based solar or wind or uh, a natural gas generator. Uh, and it is tied to the bulk power grid. As a matter of fact, our favorite situation is to be part of a network which includes the bulk power uh, network. Um, if you look at the individual building, just to, for a second, the way this happened was we started looking at buildings uh, and saying, you know, what could we do to, uh, to, uh, to have the paradigm of being in front of the meter? And so we just put a box outside, just like about the size of your air conditioning coil, three by three by three, that has sufficient storage, power electronics, um, uh, in each box is the control system, the, the power electronics and the storage uh, to serve that load. Uh, as a matter of fact, the control system learns the load over time through machine learning, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. Then you run the DC uh, solar into that DC box, uh, and then the only thing that comes out to the house uh, through the meter is split phase AC, so that the... Uh, the, the, the folks in the house are, are getting exactly uh, what they're used to. Um, this is what it would typically look like uh, in a neighborhood setting with solar on the roof and a nanogrid box in the thing. This is the, this is the diagram I wanna really focus on though. And, and the rest is just examples of this. So if you 
again, I told you I come from Intel. I come from a place where we, we were trying to sell PCs in the early days. Well, what really made the PC something important was storage. The analogy is actually striking. Um, but what really made it uh, important uh, as we went through storage from, you know, uh, first it was cassette tape, then floppy drives, then hard drives. It was seen as clunky and inexpensive and, and uh, non-reliable, just like the perception is for storage now with energy. But that's not the case because of uh, electric vehicles and the tremendous pull, there are uh, tens of gigafactories for storage going on around the world, and it will be the part of any new energy system. And so we will see in the next uh, just very few years um, that we won't, we won't think about storage anymore. It will just be part of the design. I know I'm talking in the future here, uh, but that's, uh, that's where it's going. And so that's where my head's at. Uh, but then the, but what really made the PC important was networking it. Right, so if you look at this at this diagram, and the, the circle on the left is each individual home. You think of that as a PC. Well, the PC is great on its own, but it's much more powerful if it is part of a local area network. And that's what each microgrid would be. The microgrid in this case is about, oh, half a megawatt to a megawatt. It's about 50 to 100 homes or mixed use buildings. And, uh, and then uh, at, at the next uh, circle over would be the, the energy park where we have some additional generation storage, uh, ground-based solar and, and uh, natural gas generators. That would be, in this analogy, it would be your local server. So that makes it even more powerful where you can store things that are used by all the users, right? And then the cloud is the utility grid in this analogy. And, 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 and all these things are even more effective when they have access to the cloud and all the other computers. Well, if you work this backwards now, uh, it, the, if you lose the cloud or, or the utility grid, well, you still have the resources of your local area network and central and your local server in this case. And even if you lose the microgrid, the individual home has its own uh, storage and can run for quite a while, uh, even with no resources. Uh, the other way around to look at it is if you lose one node, you lose one node, the rest of the microgrid operates uh, just fine. So uh, as Ann mentioned, uh, we decided that we needed to st start this out in a place that's non-regulated and build it really quickly and through uh, relationships, uh, which is always the key to everything. We were able to start uh, uh, this year actually with permission and get an entire DC uh, microgrid installed on a military base. It's Kirtland, it's here at Kirtland Air Force Base and it's actually up and running and I'd love to give you a tour if you're ever in Albuquerque, just give me a call. Um, we have built a community center for the Air Force Base called the Gathering Space, which we use as a demo space when we can show you on the big screens and actually move energy around and show you that. Uh, N1 through N6 on this picture is military housing, uh, temporary lodging facilities. Uh, N8 uh, is some CNI loads, just small laundromat, uh, check-in building, machine shop, which is fun loads. Uh, C1 is very important. That is our central uh, control box. And that is our tie-in to the San Diego National Labs uh, P-cell, which we call the Photovoltaics uh, Systems Evaluation Lab, where we have another uh, 30 uh, kilowatt or so of solar and some really good testing facilities there. But N9 on the other side uh, is the most attractive part of this microgrid. Uh, N9 is tied, in, tied into San Diego National Labs, uh, DETL, the Distributed Energy Technology Labs, where they have three hardware in the loop microgrids, uh, additional ground-based solar, which we are tied into. Uh, but most importantly, they have testing facilities. They have programmable loads, they have programmable generation, they can test for lightning, EMP, ground lift, and cyber, which is part of our CRADA, our collaborative research and development with them. We're looking at cyber for everything from our overall system to EV chargers. We do have a, 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 a normal level two charger, but we also have a level three charger that is all DC to DC that runs completely off the solar in the system outside of our community center. One of the things I'm most proud of is the time frame we got this all done in, which is literally all this year. Uh, so January to um, July, we actually built it. Uh, we had our ground, our grand, our ribbon cutting on September 6th, and we've been commissioning ever since, and we're ahead of schedule on that, and it's going really well. Um, the, the five R's of resiliency is just a, a quick thing to show. 
uh, and I'm trying to get through this really quickly so because I really want to respond to questions and have people ask questions. But um, the way the military or the Office of Energy Assurance uh, defines resiliency, which I really like as the five R's, robustness, redundancy, resourcefulness before the event, but after the event, which is the most critical part, response and recovery. And the way we do our control system, uh, we call it directed energy. You can literally direct energy to any building in the system uh, post event uh, in a limited energy situation. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. We also have free three, uh, for our first three commercial microgrids up and running. Uh, we have the conduit in the ground uh, for the building of homes next year. These loops are three 50 home uh, loops. Uh, which we will show interconnected and networked capabilities between three DC uh, 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 microgrids. And we are also going to hook in an AC uh, microgrid just to show that we can. And I uh, just want to talk about our UI UX, our user uh, interface and user experience. Um, we have an operator level for the utility where they will know where, where every single electron is. This is actually a screenshot of something that is in motion. You see the dots on some of those lines there. They move in relationship to how much energy they move faster or slower is how much energy is being moved and in which direction, whether it's going uh, from the solar panels uh, to our EV chargers or to our central battery or even out to the bulk power grid. Uh, or uh, or back uh, to the homes when it's dark at night, for instance, and you get every uh, uh, dashboards that show you the state of charge of all the batteries and you know where every electron is at every moment. And let me just take a moment just to talk about our control system in each and every single uh, nanogrid box. So we have nanogrids, which is each building. I'll just go back to that and show that. Each building is a nanogrid, uh, nanogrid in our system, and that nanogrid box that's outside of each one, again, has a controller in it that, again, uh, uses machine learning to learn its load from each home or each building. And so it knows exactly uh, who's in the house, when uh, loads actually occur, when the peaks are unique to that load, but it practices game theory. So in other words, it's very aware of its own loads and will make sure that the battery state of charge from a power and energy standpoint is there. It also is very aware of the community goals in the microgrid. And so it plays with those, uh, the rest of the nanogrid boxes. Um, and the central box. The central box is the same actual controller, but it takes on the role of auctioneer and sets a price uh, for the microgrid the price is not a real dollar amount. It's just an indication of whether the microgrid uh, is long or short on energy. And that makes then that determines uh, what it does with the central storage, with uh, any central generation, whether it pulls um, uh, power from the grid uh, as necessary, or if the grid is gone, uh, it sends out signals that tell everybody to save energy and to be more efficient and effective with it. Uh, it also uh, can provide a voltage bar uh, frequency support back to the utility grid. We really want this to be an asset at the end of a feeder uh, and you don't have to upgrade your feeder. The more you add of microgrids, they basically take care of themselves and can be islanded completely. And so um, puts very little stress on the utility grid, uh, but the utility grid can use it as an asset. As I said, uh, when it's long on energy, it can, it can charge batteries in the microgrid. Um, uh, in order to balance, or it can take energy uh, for uh, frequency bar support, et cetera. Anyway, I know that's very quick, uh, but I, again, I wanted to get through uh, questions. Um, there's my email in case uh, you want to uh, contact me uh, for a tour of the microgrid, and I will stand for questions. Thanks. Thank you, Gary. And I'll remind everybody the way to ask questions is through the question and answer interface in the Zoom webinar. You can type your question in there and I will uh, repeat it to Gary. I'll start you off, Gary, while we're waiting for our folks to ask their questions. Uh, I'm curious what you see as key research questions to either scale your microgrids and or expand their capabilities. Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I'll start on the technical side. Remember, I did state earlier that our biggest risk is in the regulatory environment. 
Um, microgrids are a new thing to regulators. They don't really understand them and they have meant different things to different people in the past. And so part of the problem that, you, that we have in that situation is no set of ratepayers are meant to be unfairly burdened uh, for the benefit of other ratepayers. So this is why we've had very little innovation in the last hundred years. Uh, but that is our biggest risk. But setting that aside, our technical risks um, going forward are, of course, the adoption, uh, first of all, is getting people used to the fact uh, that DC is effective. And of course, um, uh, uh, when we ask our vendors for different components, they're not used to uh, this kind of uh, use of products. Uh, so, you know, DC to DC converters and inverters that go uh, 380 DC to split phase AC for each individual home, et cetera. So, uh, we are looking for uh, the most robust and readily available and, and ready to scale because remember, every single nanograde box is the same regardless of the load of the individual building. The standardization is very important, whether it's two people in the building or six or, or 20, uh, one EV, no EVs, three EVs. And so um, we want very robust uh, nanograde boxes that can then be used in aggregate and even in parallel uh, it, uh, for larger buildings and larger loads so that we can keep that standard box the same. And so uh, that's very important to us. So uh, research along the lines of higher voltages, our, our bus voltage right now is at 750 VDC. We'd like to move to 1.5, which would allow us to go farther geographically uh, uh, due to voltage losses uh, in, in the line. And, uh, and so those, those, that's where we're going. The next place we will also go is to larger CNI applications where you would normally expect, you know, large three phase motors at 480 uh, type of uh, loads. Uh, and so we're looking for help and research there. Uh, and then uh, we'd also like to uh, incorporate into this, uh, as, as I told you, the platform uh, approach, things that other people are coming up with. Uh, uh, you know, that would, they would like to incorporate into a system like this. I hope that answers the question. It does. Thanks. Do you want to give us a little tour of um, what we're looking at right now with this interface? Yeah. So this is the UI UX I talked about. We're working with a local company, uh, RS21, who uh, those of you who are on the call probably know that that's Charles Rapp who came out on an entrepreneurial leave from San Diego National Labs. It's his company. And one of the things we love about New Mexico, the CTO, uh, Cameron Baumgartner, was my son-in-law's uh, roommate in college. Uh, but uh, but we uh, uh, we're very happy with this user interface. And what it does is it shows where every electron, uh, every watt goes at any time. You can pick time scales. You can the bottom right is a time scrub bar where you can go back one month, three months, a year. And, and see that uh, and see what's gone on in your system. Um, and then uh, the dashboards on the side, uh, they, they start with the tons of CO2 avoided. Uh, first at the house level, there, you see a side-by-side -side grid there that can be matched between the dashboards between an individual home and the entire grid. You're first seeing the whole uh, little microgrid we've got. This is actual GIS data, 3D modeling of the actual base configuration of that microgrid uh, is what it's showing there. And then it'll go into the different dashboards on the left. This is a screen recording. This is not real time right now on the base, um, uh, but this is a recording of that kind of data. And, uh, and like I said, you can actually see energy flows moving back and forth. Also, from a diagnostic standpoint, you can things turn yellow or red, depending on if they're in trouble. And so if a state of charge of a battery goes yellow or red, we would be able to know that specifically. The long term for the operator would be that you'd have a nice glowing green dot on a screen, which is each microgrid in a series of microgrids. If it turns yellow, you would double click it. It would go to this view. You would be able to then see what was yellow or red in this view and go right down to that component level. Uh, you know, send an energy technician out there to just swap out the component, take it back to the shop and find out what was wrong. And the goal would be is that no one has even had to reset their microwave clock because remember, everything runs off of batteries and has several hours or, or even days, depending on how the, the energy is managed in limited energy situations uh, of, of energy before you have to uh, supply more energy. Hey, thanks. 
Um, another, there was another question that came in as you were speaking before, and it was how are end users notified to conserve energy, um, as you mentioned? So again, it's the psychology, not the technology. So um, uh, the, the, uh, if you look at that middle panel that's showing right now, that's what uh, one of the views that the individual consumer could see. And the cool part about getting second by second data is uh, you would know exactly which the algorithms are already there. You can see it in products like Sense, et cetera. I've got one on my house right now. You can see when your refrigerator turned off, when you can turn it on, whether it's being 15% uh, or more less efficient this year than last. You can tell when your air conditioner needs refrigerant. You can see all of that. Uh, and so they'll get the benefit of knowing all of that. Um, they would get a text message uh, basically saying we've got a limited energy situation on the microgrid or on your individual nanogrid due to uh, X uh, event. Uh, therefore, uh, you may want to uh, turn off and it would tell you exactly what to turn off to conserve energy. Uh, let's say this happened at uh, 10 o'clock at night and it was in the middle of winter and you wanna make sure that your heat runs through the, through the night. Uh, it, would, uh, it would tell you what you could do to make sure that you run through the night. Uh, et cetera. Long term, uh, as appliances become available, and if you look at LG, they're already offering products that are that are DC and AC. And I can tell you right now that I can talk to my refrigerator and my washer and dryer in my house now. Uh, that will uh, continue, especially when these types of products are available to accelerate. And eventually, uh, you could set preferences ahead of time so that that would automatically be, be done by your nanogrid box controller. It would automatically go in and do things like uh, either delay your, your dryer coming on um, or actually even limit appliances in a situation where you would prefer uh, that you have heat through the night versus anything else. So if these systems are in front of the meter and potentially utility owned, then would the utility have the control to make those decisions possibly? Uh, in the military situation, they would. Uh, in the consumer, they would not. So let me explain. Um, and then there's also privacy issues in here too. So let me just lump those all together. Um, the, uh, we know that there are going to be some consumers that would be like, I, you know, I don't care about any of this. Just, I want the lights to go on when I turn the switch. Fine. That's some percentage, which I think will diminish over time, but there will, there will always be some section that do that. There'll be the middle part, the middle part of consumers that, uh, or, or percentage of consumers that would just, they want to set preferences and then just leave things alone and get alerted if something goes out of range. And then there'll be the ones like, you know, like most of the people on this call, which are going to want to go in there and play with stuff. And they will have that capability uh, all over the place. They would be able to see their own house. They would be able to see the aggregate of their neighbor's houses and how the grid is doing, but they would not be able to see a specific other neighbor's house. Um, we would give the control uh, uh, knob uh, to the operator in a base situation. They could have uh, anarchy mode. Uh, which would be that they let every, all the controllers just talk to each other and run. I don't think that most utilities will do that. They'll want to have their finger on the scale. So that would be in control mode. Control, basic control mode uh, would allow them to control for major events and, uh, and direct energy uh, as necessary to keep the most uh, uh, consumers, customers, ratepayers, whatever you have, uh, happy. And then they would have uh, what we call internally dictator mode that probably won't make it all the way to market. And I apologize for even saying that out loud on a webinar, but that would be where in extreme limited energy situations that they could literally uh, decide through pricing uh, who got energy and who did not. Um, that's, that's mainly for people who are running military installations or campuses. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. And we have a comment um, from Jack Joukowsky, who's chair of uh, the New Mexico EBSCOR State Committee and uh, a member of the Association of Commerce and Industry in New Mexico. I think he's on the board there as well. And he says, Gary, don't forget to approach the uh, ACI if you need assistance with any New Mexico legislation help. Uh, the economic development and Technology Platform Committee has been a long supporter of EBSCOR and the use of related technologies that can benefit our state. So um, know that you have potential supporters there too to advance your agenda. Thank you, Jack. As a former uh, board member and member, I, was, I ran the uh, uh, medical services uh, and, uh, committee for that for a while when I had that medical uh, company I told you about earlier. Uh, big supporter of ACI and what they do and, uh, and understand that 
if we don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu uh, legislatively and absolutely will approach ACI. We've been, this is, we've been kind of in stealth mode. We're just now coming out and just now starting to be commercial, but Jack, appreciate that and would love to come and give a quick uh, demo uh, to any ACI group that's uh, interested. Great, thanks. Well, I'll ask one more question. Um, I'll remind our folks who are attending that this is a good time to type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, but just because our project has so many students, I'm wondering um, what, what future workforce you see that is in demand, uh, skills that our students should be trying to get so that they can work in these areas and work toward the future grid and in the, the future grid workforce. Well, uh, I'll give you a, uh, I'll do better than that. I'll give you a contact at each of the universities. Um, uh, if, if you're talking about an energy tech, for instance, at the six week at the entry level, um, uh, which is probably not the, the audience we're talking to, but I'll just start there. Uh, you would talk to Kyle Lee at Ingenuity for CNM. They have, they're working with Workforce uh, Solutions and, and Bill McCamley, uh, current uh, director there, uh, cabinet secretary, excuse me, uh, on a, a energy tech uh, curricula. Uh, and, and also with uh, the Albuquerque Academy to even eventually get that into high schools. At uh, the uh, UNM level, you would talk to Ali Bidram, uh, who recently took over for Andrea Mamoli, uh, who literally has a microgrid uh, curricula there uh, within the mechanical and electrical engineering departments. And then if you were at NMSU, I would go talk directly to Olga and, uh, and, and get involved in that way. And all of the people I just mentioned have complete access to this and to me and to anything that we discover. And we are always looking for interested students and thought leaders for that matter uh, to join us in this and to uh, progress this, uh, this model. Great, thanks. Well, um, two of the three of those folks are in our project team and also at Santa Fe Community College. We're starting the Smart and Microgrid Training Center. I think uh, Frank Curry joined them this month and is potentially on this webinar today. So um, that will be a good person for you to connect with too and for him to connect with Kyle Lee at CNM. And we partner with Siemens and, and Frank, if you're on the call, I apologize for not getting up there yet. I've just been a little busy installing this microgrid and, and, and uh, commissioning it, but I really need to get up to Santa Fe Community College. Uh, well, he's just started too, so um, this is good timing. Good. Great. Well, I don't see any other questions coming in from our folks and Frank says Frank is indeed on. So great that we've made that connection here today. Um, so we will end this webinar a bit early, but as a reminder, it will it is recorded and will be archived on our website so folks can revisit this and also our project team members who weren't available to make this time today will be able to hear it. And I know that there will be many future connections between your projects, Gary, and our work at the New Mexico Smart Grid Center. So thank you very much for your time today presenting. And as a reminder to all of those on this webinar today, our next webinar will be November 22nd at noon, and it's the New Mexico National Laboratories presenting on issues related to microgrids and research that they're undertaking. So thank you again, Gary, uh, for your wonderful presentation and this great work that you're doing in New Mexico. And we will be back on next month with you all. It was a pleasure. Thank you.